This video is brought to you by Wren. More on them in just a couple minutes. I don't know if you've noticed, but we are kind of obsessed with efficiency, especially here in the US. We want everything to be efficient, from our homes, to our cars, to ourselves. And on the surface, efficiency sounds like a great idea. Of course we want things to run efficiently, why would we want to waste time and energy and money and resources? But it's not that simple. Efficiency has started to infiltrate almost every facet of our lives, and whenever something becomes that ubiquitous, we should question it, especially when it's been a part of our institutions for so long that we hardly seem to even notice it anymore. So what I want to do today is figure out what efficiency is, look at its history and how it's taken over everything, and ask the question, is being efficient really all it's cracked up to be? But before we jump into that, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Ren. If you have watched many of my videos, then you probably know all about Wren. They've been really good to the channel, and I have worked with them for almost a whole year now because I genuinely believe in what they're doing. For those of you who don't know, Wren is a website where you can go to calculate your carbon footprint and then find ways to help reduce and offset that footprint by funding a variety of carbon reduction projects. But they also do a lot more than that, too, because climate change is a big issue. Honestly, it can be really overwhelming to figure out where to even begin, but Wren makes it super easy. When you go to their site, they have you answer a few questions about your lifestyle and what kind of action you want to take, and then they offer you several super easy things you can do to make a difference. If you want to just help fund carbon reduction projects, great. They have a ton of amazing options like helping to prevent wildfires in California or restoring the health of forests in Scotland. If you want to help the people affected by climate change, then you can fund a project that provides clean cooking fuel to refugees in Uganda. And if you want to have an effect on big picture policy, then REN has options for that too, through their partnership with the Clean Air Task Force and Carbon 180. Regardless of which project you choose or how much you choose to put toward it, you'll be able to see exactly where your money is going, because REN is super transparent about their entire budget. They break everything down and even share updates and pictures to let you know how the projects are going. If this sounds like something that you want to get in on, then check out REN using the link in the description or in the pinned comment, and the first 100 people to sign up with that link will get their first month covered by REN for free. So not only will you be helping out the channel by supporting our sponsor, but you'll be doing a whole month of real good for free. Again, the link is on the screen, in the description, and in the pinned comment. And thanks again to Ren for sponsoring. But with that out of the way, let's get back to the video. I am Zoe B. I am a college professor turned YouTuber. I taught English for almost five years and then left to start a YouTube channel, and now I make video essays. So video essays are basically like mini amateur documentaries, and most of what I talk about is like education and language and things like that. So I'm here to talk a little bit about my upcoming video and give you all a little sneak peek and yeah, just pull back the curtain a little bit and share some of the background stuff that not everybody knows about or gets to see. And yeah, I'm excited. Efficiency is one of those things that feels really simple as a concept, but the more you look into it, the more you realize it's not. Most of us understand efficiency as a relationship between input and output. If something is efficient, that means it generates an output with as little input as possible. It's doing more with less. Efficient vehicles drive farther with less gas. Efficient businesses make more profit with less overhead. Efficient people get more done with less time. Input, output, easy peasy. But <laughs> input and output aren't always easy peasy. When we talk about minimizing our input, what we're actually talking about is minimizing waste. Because of this silly little thing called the law of conservation of energy, if we want to do a thing, we have to spend stuff to make that thing happen. If you want to get from point A to point B, you have to spend energy to get there. And waste is what happens when you spend more of that energy than is necessary. But most problems aren't as straightforward as what is the fastest route from A to B? And it's not always so easy to figure out what waste is. Just because something appears wasteful, that doesn't always mean it is. And when we talk about our output, we're talking about whether our system is effective, whether it does what it's supposed to do. But effectiveness is sometimes really squishy. Consider education. What makes an education effective? Is it getting a good job after you graduate? 
Does it come down to your salary or how much you put back into the world? Or your level of personal happiness? I mean, how do you even measure and quantify those things? It's complicated. <laughs> But Zoe, I hear you say, efficiency may be complicated, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and to be fair, I never said that efficiency was bad. I just said that it was everywhere and anything that is everywhere is worth investigating. But now that we know what efficiency means, our next step is to figure out where it came from. So. Efficiency is one of those concepts that feels really intuitive. It's like, yeah, of course we want to get the most out of our stuff. Of course we want more for less. Duh, that's just, like, human nature. It could be argued that our little monkey brains like efficiency for evolutionary reasons, but on a wider scale as a societal thing, our obsession with efficiency is actually pretty new in the grand scheme of all of human existence. While the word efficient has been around in the English language since the late 14th century, its usage in the US didn't really explode until the early 20th century, thanks to this guy, Frederick Winslow Taylor. So, Freddie Taylor was a mechanical engineer who made a name for himself through a system that he called scientific management. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the details here, but basically, in 1910, some railroads wanted to raise their prices, and they had to make their case against the case of the local merchants who didn't want their shipping costs to increase in a hearing with the Interstate Commerce Commission. So the railroads' lawyers said that they needed to raise prices, but the merchants' lawyers, along with a bunch of engineers and managers on their side, said, well, actually, we've done some calculations, and it turns out you can save yourself and us a bunch of money if you just run your businesses more efficiently. Now, Freddie Tay wasn't actually a part of this hearing, but he was the one who had created and helped implement this scientific management system with a different railroad in another part of the country, as well as in factories and steel mills and cotton mills across the nation. And the merchants had brought in witnesses from several of these industries to support the idea that if you just focused on efficiency in your business, you could save thousands or even millions of dollars. While the merchants did end up winning the case for reasons unrelated to their scientific management trump card, the case ended up skyrocketing both Taylor and his concept of scientific management into the public eye. Journalists, reporters, and publishers flocked to get the scoop on this magic system that promised to help businesses both increase wages for workers and increase overall profits. And in 1911, our boy FT published his book, The Principles of Scientific Management, which solidified his place in the annals of history and laid the groundwork for the entire next century of industry in the United States and the world. But you might be asking, what even is this magical scientific management thing? Well, as Taylor outlined in his book, scientific management is focused on using the scientific method to find the one best way of performing any particular job, and it's the manager's job to do all the work to scientifically determine what that one best way is, and then it's the worker's job to do whatever their manager has told them to the best of their ability. Where before, workers had just used their own brains to figure out the best way for them to accomplish the task that they were assigned, now that was all the job of the manager. As one man who worked under Taylor described it, Taylor told him he was not supposed to think. There are other people paid for thinking around here. Big oof. <laughs> Believe it or not, managers were really into this way of running things. They used scientific management to reorganize their factory floors so that workers had shorter routes from one machine to another. They used stopwatches to time their workers and developed precise choreographies for how to perform each job so they could be done in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of wasted movement. And businesses thrived. Productivity soared. Now, workers and labor rights activists weren't exactly thrilled about this because it turned workers into machines that were required to simply follow instructions like obedient little robots, but we'll get into that later. Taylor's system worked, and that was all that mattered. It worked so well, in fact, that people started to take the principles of scientific management and apply them to all sorts of other domains, like churches, schools, the medical field, and the military. 
which all started to implement organizational and record-keeping systems within those management hierarchies outlined by Taylor. The cult of efficiency even reached homemaking. In 1911, there was an article series on home efficiency published by Outlook that asked readers, Does your home pay? Does it make a fair return on the investment of time and strength and money that's put into it? As a factory for the production of citizenship, is it a success? That's the accent I'm going with. <laughs> Another article about scientific management in the home asked, Cannot the management of the average household be conducted as a business proposition? The author then answered his own question with an example, as paraphrased here by Raymond Callahan, where the home's management could work out 10 or 12 standardized meals, each with a standard content, a standard procedure, and a standard time, and those meal prep times could also be standardized down to the second. And this is my favorite part. <laughs> For those servants who developed into efficient first-class workers, and who, for example, did not waste seconds gazing out the window while putting the biscuits into the oven, the author suggested an appropriate reward. Wasting seconds gazing out the window while putting the biscuits into the oven. And no comment. <laughs> Perfect system. Love it. Efficiency was everywhere, being pushed by many in powerful positions, including recently retired U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, who gave a speech in defense of efficiency in 1913 to his audience of students. You must be efficient. You must be able to hold your own in the world of politics, the world of business, able to keep your own head above water to make your work satisfactory, to make it pay. If you do not, you cannot do good to others. You must be efficient. You must never forget for a moment that, so far from being a base theory, it is a vital doctrine, a doctrine vital to good in this country. Efficiency was king. Frederick Taylor looked at the world like it was a machine that could be calibrated and tweaked until it ran as efficiently as possible. And over the decades, Scientific management became known as Taylorism, and it gave birth to industrial engineering, an entirely new field of engineering focused on optimizing organizations. And the rest is history. Okay, but that was all like a hundred years ago. What is the current state of all this efficiency talk? Well, let's just say it hasn't gotten better. <laughs> Today, we are obsessed with efficiency, even more than we were a hundred years ago. We've even developed new terms for it, like hustle culture and the grind. It's basically the entire ethos of Silicon Valley. Hell, Mark Zuckerberg even dubbed 2023 the year of efficiency. Efficiency has taken over our workplaces. We have Uber and Lyft to make sure that we can always get to work without the issues of owning our own car or having to use unreliable public transportation. We have calendar apps and note-taking apps and virtual whiteboards so we can stay organized at work. We have DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub so we can order food straight to the office so we don't have to take time away from work to do silly things like eat. And when we're done with work, we have Slack and Zoom and email so we're always reachable because we're never really done with work, are we? Even when COVID hit, people were still focused on efficiency in their work. The lockdown days were full of stories of people picking up side hustles and using their free time to gain new skills that they could monetize. You were stuck at home all day, so you might as well make that time productive, right? Why waste your time relaxing or spending time with your family when you could be grinding? If you're not monetizing your hobbies, what are you even doing? <laughs> efficiency has also taken over our media. Remember when Quibi was a thing? People were tired of spending entire tens of minutes watching traditional TV shows, so Quibi came to the rescue, providing stories with runtimes of under 10 minutes. Now, Quibi failed, but it didn't fail because people didn't like short-form content. I mean, the existence of TikTok disproves that theory. Quibi died because its shows weren't very good, and it was managed really badly, and it released during lockdown when most of us weren't commuting to work anymore. But the success of TikTok and now YouTube Shorts has shown that people love short-form media. TikToks and Shorts and Reels are the most efficient way to consume videos. You get something funny or entertaining or visually pleasing or informative without wasting a bunch of time on all that fluff present in longer-form content. Please don't look at the timestamp. 
We also have things like Blinkist, which is an audiobook app that doesn't just read you books, it reads you summaries of books. Because the most efficient way to learn stuff is to get the broad strokes in a short amount of time. You can always go back through and get the details later, right? <laughs> Blinkist didn't come out of nowhere either, it's just following a trend that has been growing for some time in education. Schools are especially susceptible to efficiency talk, partially because they're publicly funded and people want to ensure a return on investment for their tax dollars. Even a hundred years ago, when this efficiency business was first kicking off, people complained that schools were taking too much tax money without anything to show for it. There are even some states whose constitutions declare it the duty of the state to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of public free schools. And efficient means, of course, cheap and effective. <laughs> Our economy is built on efficiency. All of our systems are built on efficiency. Google is built on efficiency. How do you think that their search algorithms work? When we're surrounded by terabytes upon terabytes of news articles and cat pictures and YouTube videos and memes and product listings and movie reviews and recipes, how are we supposed to sift through all that stuff on our own? But this video isn't just about the fact that efficiency exists and is important. I want to figure out whether it's a good thing or not. And to do that, we need to look a little closer at some of the places where it has the deepest roots, some of the industries where efficiency is taken as an absolute good. And to help us do that, I want to focus not on efficiency as a whole, but on its two parts, the input and the output, the waste and the effectiveness. Because if we could show that the two parts of the efficiency equation are flawed, then we could show that efficiency itself is flawed. So, up first, the input problem. My video creation process is, I think, very similar to what a lot of people do, which is I come up with an idea and then I start doing research on it. I find a bunch of books and I find a bunch of articles and then I start writing and the writing process is by far the most difficult. And it's once I start writing that I'm actually able to figure out what it is that I don't know. And that's when I go back to research and I find more books and I find more articles and then I keep writing and then I have to edit because I am a very sort of verbose person. <laughs> I mean, really the, the difficult question is, you know, how much of what I say is useless? You know, how much of that first pass at writing the script is, you know. Waste is bad. Whether it's time or money or power or energy or food or art supplies, Whenever we do a thing, we should try not to use more of our stuff than we absolutely need to. We shouldn't waste it. But that raises the question, what do we mean by waste? When we're talking about efficiency, waste is what happens when we reach our goal using a suboptimal route. If we know the shortest path from point A to point B, anything that deviates from that is a waste of resources. So in order to figure out what waste is, we first need to know what our goal is and the best way to reach it. And this is pretty straightforward when it comes to things like chemistry, situations where you know exactly what your goal is and there is one best path and you can figure out exactly how much you need of each particular resource to get you there. If you want to make water molecules, you know that to make them you need two hydrogens for each oxygen. If your ratio is off, you're going to end up wasting resources. The issue is that not everything is like chemistry. There isn't one best way to accomplish every task. This was the problem with Taylor's scientific management. He believed that every job had one ideal, perfectly efficient method of being accomplished. But that's just not true. Even for relatively straightforward tasks like getting from your apartment to the airport, just because a particular path is the shortest as the crow flies, that doesn't mean that it's the best path. The best path might come down to what time of day it is, or if there's a concert downtown, or whether there's construction happening, or a thousand other things. And this throws a huge wrench into the whole question of what counts as waste. Because if there is no one best way, then there is no way to know what deviates from that one best way, because it doesn't exist. So instead of one best way, we have many good ways and many more bad ways and even more in between ways. So now our question is, how do you decide which of those many 
many ways of doing things is the best? How do you decide what's wasteful and what isn't? Well, the good news <laughs> is that most of the time, you don't have to pick. For a lot of our jobs and systems and structures, that choice has been made for us by the people in charge. So that's good, right? I mean, the people in charge would always choose the most optimal way of doing things, right? Remember that quote from the journalist in the 1910s who was talking about how we could incorporate scientific management into our homes? The one about how the head of the house should reward their servants for not wasting precious seconds looking out the window while they worked? Well, our society is the house and we are the servants. <laughs> not to go all, we live in a society, but there are power structures and those power structures are what determine what counts as wasteful and what doesn't. Some kinds of behaviors are seen as more valuable than others and anything that isn't valuable is a waste. And again, not to go all, we live in a society, but those valuable behaviors are the ones that fit our arbitrary standards for what is normal and good and natural. Standards that always seem to fit perfectly onto the marginalization bingo card. We got racism, misogyny, heteronormativity, ableism, and colonialism. Bingo. <laughs> this game isn't uh, a lot of fun. Don't take it to parties. <laughs> Traditionally masculine pastimes are useful. Traditionally feminine ones are a waste of time. Neurotypical behavior is a sign of respect. Neurodivergent behavior is a sign of laziness. Logic is valuable, emotions are not. Work is important, leisure is not. To quote Lux Alptrom's article about how Silicon Valley's obsession with efficiency is fundamentally rooted in sexism, that's literally the name of the article. <laughs> What's often left unsaid in these discussions about efficiency is who's drawing the line between productive work and time-wasting distractions. Are house cleaning, food prep, and other derided aspects of daily life really just frivolous time sucks? Or is this designation merely the opinion of the well-compensated white men who dominate Silicon Valley? Yes, decision fatigue is a real phenomenon. And yes, reducing time spent on tasks that are more exhausting than energizing is generally a good idea. But that doesn't mean devoting time to deciding what to wear or what to make for dinner is solely a brain drain and not, say, inspiration for further creativity or innovation. Hey, quick question. Uh, how many of you are playing on your phone right now? Or doodling? Or working on homework? Or cooking? Probably lots of you, right? How about this? If you were watching this video while doing something else, you are legally obligated to give the video a like. And if you were listening while doing homework, you are legally obligated to subscribe if you haven't already. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Oh, and if you weren't doing something else, if you were giving this video your entire undivided attention, I give you permission to comment, I am Zoe's number one fan. And if I find out that someone commented that while not giving this video their undivided attention, I will personally come to your house and spread crunchy peanut butter across the interior and exterior panes of every single window you have. But anyway, <laughs> if you were doing something else while watching this video, don't worry, I do the same thing. When I was in graduate school, I was in class and I was doodling while I was listening to the lecturer because my brain is wired in a way that means that if you want me to listen to you, I need to be doing something else. And as I was listening, the professor called me out. She stopped what she was doing and went, oh, hey, Zoe, what are you drawing there? And of course I was mortified. <laughs> so I just sheepishly went, oh, just a tree. And she laughed and went on with her lecture and I didn't doodle for the rest of class. Did it matter to her that I was actually listening while I was doodling? No. Did it matter to her that afterward, when I was too embarrassed to do anything but keep my eyes forward the whole time, I literally don't remember anything from the rest of the lecture? Nope. Did it matter that I wasn't following our unwritten rules for what it looks like to be paying attention and that I was instead wasting time doing something useless? Apparently that is the only thing that mattered to her. <laughs> And I get why my teacher called me out. I mean, she really shouldn't have, but I get it. You can't really read your students' minds, and so it's really hard to tell whether they're paying attention or not if they don't give those easy-to-read signals like eye contact. But schools have decided that they need to police students' brains and bodies to ensure that they're doing things efficiently. 
My teacher was the master of the house telling me that I need to stop wasting seconds staring out the window while baking her biscuits. <sighs> that is not a euphemism. <laughs> Even when we don't have someone else telling us what to do and how to do it, we still put these same kinds of boundaries on ourselves. I am constantly worrying about whether I'm being productive enough for this job. There will be days where all I'll do is read and take notes all day, and I feel like I've gotten nothing done, because it doesn't look like what society says productivity looks like. It looks like I'm just wasting time. This is especially true for a lot of intellectual and artistic pursuits, too. You have no idea the number of entire paragraphs that I wrote and then just cut out of the script. I had a whole section near the beginning where I was going to list out all of these, like, different definitions of efficiency from all of these different dictionaries, and then we would spend time going through them and figuring out which ones were best. But after I wrote it all out, I realized it was a big old waste of time. It would not have been a very efficient use of your time. Or mine. Like, y'all know what efficiency is. We all know what efficiency is. I don't have to go through all these different definitions. And then I was actually going to start this section by talking about, like, making vegetable soup and how you can use the unusable parts of the vegetables to make the vegetable stock. And that was going to be my analogy for waste. But, like, no. <laughs> no one need Like, you know what I mean by waste. That's it. I don't need an entire metaphor for that. Even now, looking back at this script as I'm writing it, I constantly worry that everything I'm saying is a waste. How much of this do you already know? I mean, I'm sure some of you are aware of a lot of what I've talked about, but does that mean that I shouldn't have mentioned it? Who am I making these videos for? For you who already know a lot of this? Or for total newcomers who are hearing a lot of this stuff for the first time? Is all of this just a waste of time? When I was reading back through those sections and when I realized that they sucked, I was almost mad at myself for writing them at all. Writing those bad sections hadn't just almost wasted your time, but it wasted my time too. When I was writing those shitty paragraphs, I could have been writing these amazing, awesome paragraphs. My goal was to write a good video, and writing a bad section means that I had used my time and energy to get me farther from the goal, not closer. But then, the writing teacher part of my brain piped up and reminded me that wasn't a waste. Sure, that section doesn't actually appear in the script, but that doesn't mean that the act of writing that section was a waste of time. Because I had to write that section to get these sections. I had to write the shitty stuff and then read it back in order to see that it was bad. No one writes amazing first drafts. No one. <laughs> Everyone has to write a bad thing so they can write the good thing later. Just because it felt like it was a waste of time, that doesn't mean it was a waste of time. That's how writing works, and it's also how a lot of other kinds of art works, too. You know the number of times that someone has complained about a particular scene in a book or movie because it doesn't have a point? People seem to think that if a part of a piece of art is not directly and obviously connected to the plot or purpose, then it's useless. If there isn't any dialogue or action, then the scene simply isn't worth watching, I guess. Now, for a lot of artists, when they're faced with this complaint, they answer it by saying, well, not everything has to be in service to the plot. But I want to tweak that a little bit, because generally speaking, I agree, but I think it comes down to how you define in service to and the plot. When someone says, this scene doesn't do anything, I think that what they mean is that they just can't see what it's doing, not that it's doing nothing and to us doing nothing is okay. Think of it in terms of my doodling experience from earlier. When my teacher called me out on doodling during class, she was basically saying, this thing you're doing doesn't have a point. She was saying it was a waste of time because it wasn't related to the class. In reality, what I was doing did have a point. It was related to the class. It was actively helping me pay attention. It just didn't look like it because of our societal standards of what attention is supposed to look like. And I think that that's what's happening in these art discussions, too. When characters just hang out, or when the camera follows them as they go through seemingly mundane actions, or, heaven forbid, when there's a sex scene. It's not that these scenes do nothing for the piece as a whole and that's okay. It's that they do actually do something for the plot, or the character development, or for any of the other things that make art art. It just doesn't look like it because of our societal standards of what art is supposed to look like. 
we've started to have this very utilitarian view of art, where everything that isn't immediately and obviously relevant needs to be cut. Like, there was some big Twitter drama a couple weeks ago where everyone was up in arms about how long video essays should be. Lots of people were defending long essays, but there was a whole swath of people who thought that any amount of theatrics was a waste of time, and everything should be as short and concise as possible. This is why we have things like TikTok and YouTube Shorts and Blinkist. Because, yeah, when you want things to be distilled down into their most concise versions, you'll get videos that are only 90 seconds long and books that you can absorb in 15 minutes. But just because something is concise doesn't mean it's good. Playing a song at two times speed doesn't make it sound twice as good. Every single movie or book or TV show or video essay or video game could be summarized in a single sentence. And if you want the most concise version of this video, go to my second channel, where I've uploaded a five minute version of it, as well as a shorts version of it. So if you wanna get all the information with none of the details, if you want all of this art while doing as little work as possible, just go watch one of those. <laughs> now, that is not to say that there is no such thing as waste, even in artistic and intellectual pursuits. Sometimes I do spend time writing stuff that doesn't ever end up being useful or sparking any new ideas. And sometimes those scenes in movies are actually useless. Like, have you seen the Snyder Cut of Justice League? <laughs> you didn't need that, Zach. And sometimes video essays are longer than they should be. Please forgive me, fellow video essayists. But waste, real waste, is hard to define. There is a thin, squishy, wibbly-wobbly line between doodling in my notebook so I can hear my professor more clearly and doodling in my notebook because I'm bored out of my fucking mind and this lecture sucks and I don't give a shit anymore. But I can't leave because that would be rude and maybe it'll get better as it goes on and it's really hard to say whether any of this is actually going to be helpful, but there is a chance that it might be so I might as well stay, but I have to do something while I'm listening or my brain is going to explode. <laughs> Long story short, efficiency often looks like inefficiency because one person's waste is another person's usefulness. So it's not even that waste doesn't exist or even that waste is good, actually. It's just that we seem to do a bad job of figuring out whether something is actually waste or not. Minimizing waste isn't bad. It's just that when we focus on minimizing waste, we often end up minimizing some of the good stuff that just happens to look like waste, too. But this leads us to our next question. Let's say we minimize waste, real waste, and we're able to actually do the thing that we've been trying to do. We still have to ask, are we sure that thing is worth doing? I had to take a break uh, between those paragraphs because I... Uh, almost passed out. This, friends, is why, um, you know, you, uh, eat food and also drink water. I literally, I went and, like, laid down. Uh, it was, it was not good. I'm, and I have, like, chills. Where this is what I'm doing. This is the, the sacrifices that I make for this content. Um, please like and subscribe and <laughs> join the Patreon. <laughs> oh, okay, good one, Zoe. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay. <sighs> oh, that is a difficult question. What is the best video I have ever made? Oh, I mean, it really depends on how you define best, I guess, because the video that I am proudest of and the video that has the most views is my grading video. It has like two and a half million views. It has all of these wonderful comments from people saying, you know, oh, you totally changed how I think about this. My Willy Wonka video, I think, is really awesome. Though I also really liked the conservative kids books one, you know, anytime that I get to collaborate with other other creators is just an awesome time. Yeah, I mean, the, the grading video has, you know, so many, like, positive comments and really... I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> How else do you define good? The other half of the efficiency equation is the issue of effectiveness. Even if you can minimize your waste, your real waste, you still need to you know, actually do the thing that you're trying to do. 
because what's the point in having a fuel-efficient car if it doesn't actually work, right? It is good for things to be effective, to accomplish the thing that they were built to accomplish. But in order to call something effective, you have to know what the goal is first, because the word effective can't stand on its own. You can't just be effective. You have to be effective at something. You can only be effective in relation to a goal. Like, we can only call a medicine effective if we know what it was made to cure. Otherwise, how could we know if it effectively cured that thing, right? But just like the issue of waste, not everything is as black and white as curing an illness. Consider the cobra effect. There are several different variations of this story. One of them happened in India, another in Vietnam, or Georgia, the state, not the country. But they all follow the same trajectory. There is a group of people with a problem, like a town getting overrun by snakes. And someone in power gives an incentive to people willing to help with the problem, like the government offering a bounty to citizens who can bring in snake skins to prove that they have helped to cull the population. But then the incentive backfires and actually makes the problem worse, like people who then start breeding snakes so they have more snake skins to bring in to claim more bounties and make more money, which actually then increases the snake population. Looking back, we can ask, was the solution, bounty, effective? The answer is, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what the goal was. If the goal was to decrease the snake population, no, it was the opposite of effective. But if the goal was to get snake skins, then hell yeah, it was effective. It was extremely effective. If you measure effectiveness by how closely you met your goal, you need to make sure that you know what your goal is. And even more importantly, you need to make sure that your basis of measurement actually matches that goal. Like, if you're measuring the number of snakes killed using the number of snake skins gathered, you need to make sure that snake skins gathered actually equals number of snakes killed. This is an example of Goodhart's Law, which states that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. If you measure the number of snakes killed based on the number of snake skins, then the number of snake skins becomes the target. And when that's the target, people focus on maximizing that metric, not the other metric that you're actually trying to increase. And then it screws up your entire system. <laughs> In situations like this, what's happened is there's a disconnect between what one study termed the measure of effectiveness and the measure of performance. Now, when you look into these terms, they seem to be mostly used by the US Department of Defense. I don't know if that's really important, but I think it's worth noting just for transparency. <laughs> One study framed it like this. When you have a situation, there is a desired effect to be achieved. There is a need to measure the degree to which that effect is being achieved, and direct measurement of the desired effect is either difficult or impossible. The analyst must then identify some other attribute of the system under study that is not difficult or impossible to measure, and whose value correlates in some known way with achievement of the desired effect the analyst is stuck measuring this proxy variable. So the initial thing that you're trying to achieve is your measure of effectiveness, but the proxy that you use instead is your measure of performance. In the snake situation, you want to minimize the number of snakes, but it's not really feasible to measure that directly, so you use a proxy, in this case the number of snake skins, to stand in for the thing that you're actually trying to measure. The measure of effectiveness is the number of snakes, but the measure of performance is the number of snake skins. The issue is that when you use a proxy, you are staking your entire system on the relationship between your MOE and your MOP. And if there's a significant disconnect between the two, your assumption can have some pretty serious unintended consequences. In the snake example, they reasoned that one cobra skin was equivalent to one less live cobra, and that the person presenting that skin had killed the cobra and was thus entitled to the agreed-upon bounty for killing a cobra. We know now that though these assumptions were perfectly reasonable, they turned out to be false, thanks to Goodhart's law. This is how we end up with a lot of garbage, especially on the internet. Just like how if you measure the number of snakes killed based on how many snake skins you got, you end up with people breeding snakes, if you measure the relevance of a web page based on how many keywords it has in it, you end up getting keyword spam in the form of SEO. 
if you measure the quality of a YouTube video based on how many people click the thumbnail, you end up getting clickbait. If you measure a student's education based on how they score on one particular test, you end up getting students who have been taught to the test and who spend hundreds of hours on test prep and who only care about school insofar as it helps them pass this one test. When you measure effectiveness based on a faulty goal, you end up incentivizing the wrong things. Sure, you might technically reach that goal, you might technically be effective, but if you are effectively reaching a bad goal, is that still effective? You know the most effective way to play a video game? <laughs> well, fun is difficult to measure, so if we have the proxy goal of beating the game, then what's most effective is looking up a guide, going on a subreddit to figure out the meta, and then making sure that you make all the right decisions and have the most optimized build. But just because something is optimized and efficient and technically the best, that doesn't mean it's fun. Or consider what effective classroom management looks like. Teachers police the bodies and brains of their students because it's effective. Effective at what, you ask? Why, effective at making it look like students are well-behaved. Just look at this class. Look at how obedient those students are. Who cares if it's a good thing to be obedient? All that matters is that they are obedient. Obedience is our measure of performance, but what is the measure of effectiveness? Why are we asking them to be obedient? What does this obedience represent? When we measure the behavior of students based on their sitting still, making eye contact, obeying the every word of the teacher, and taking and scoring well on tests and other quantifiable metrics of assessment, we end up with classes run under draconian policies enforced with an iron fist. Because, yes, just like the most effective way to get snake skins is to breed snakes, the most effective way to have students be obedient is to run your class like a military regiment or a factory. If that's your goal, that's the best way to reach it. If you measure student learning based on exam scores, what's most effective is teaching to the test. If you measure a student's attention based on what a student is looking at, what's most effective is using Proctorio's eye tracking technology to ensure students are facing their computer screen at all times. If you measure the educational value of a learning management system based on how personalized it is to each student, what's most effective is having the system mine as much personal data from the students as it can. If you measure student discipline based on their outward behavior, what's most effective is to have strict rules about sitting still and facing forward and swift corporal punishments for anyone who dares step outside the bounds. Maybe it's high time we asked ourselves, sure, what we're doing is effective, but is it good? Yes, we can run our classes like factories, and we can police our students' bodies, and we can deny them privacy, but what are we actually gaining by doing that? I mean, we're sure as hell not actually getting anything good out of it, but who cares that having students do well on exams doesn't actually equate to real knowledge gained? Who cares that eye contact doesn't really have that much to do with what a student is paying attention to? Who cares that perfectly tailored computer learning management software actually isn't a good thing for students? Who cares that students sitting still and behaving doesn't actually equate to discipline and self-control and any of those other personal skills that students should learn? Who cares that corporal punishment is actively harmful to students? Who cares what our rigid systems are really implicitly teaching our students about achievement and power and self-worth? Who cares? <laughs> We're getting something measurable and superficially attractive, so who gives a shit about the methods, right? All that matters is that stuff looks like it's effective, and if it looks effective, it is effective. There's no reason to look any deeper. We have all these snake skins, so we must be decreasing the population of snakes, right? <sighs> You know the number one indicator of student success in school? Students' home life. Their family's socioeconomic status, how much their parents support them, how much value their parents put on education, how many books they have. So, if the government really cared about raising test scores, if they really wanted the most effective method for increasing student success, you know what they'd do? They'd take all those kids away from their parents. The earlier the better and they would give them to a state-sponsored family with a perfect, ideal home environment, and the students would finally be able to succeed in school. But Zoe, 
I hear you say. Isn't that kind of <laughs> extreme? And yeah, it is. You're right. Like, yeah, of course we shouldn't rip children out of their parents' arms at birth so they can get better grades. But that's the point. It is extreme, and we don't do it even though it would be effective. All I'm asking is, why? <laughs> why do we do all those other things that I listed a few minutes ago, but draw the line here? I want to tell you a story about Friedrich Nietzsche. So, in his later years, Nietzsche's health was failing. His eyesight was getting worse, and he had chronic headaches, and all of this got worse when he wrote, which, as a writer and philosopher, writing was pretty much his whole job. So, when he heard that a new kind of typewriter had been invented that promised to facilitate up to 800 characters per minute, he jumped on the opportunity. Nietzsche purchased the Mauling Hansen Writing Ball, a new typewriter that had been engineered to be as efficient as possible. It was ergonomic, it allowed for fast and accurate typing, and once Nietzsche had learned the layout, he could write quickly even with his eyes closed. And the typewriter was effective. It did help Nietzsche write more quickly. But it came at a cost. One of Nietzsche's closest friends noticed a change in the style of his writing. Nietzsche's prose had become tighter, more telegraphic. There was a new forcefulness to it too, as though the machine's power, its iron, was, through some mysterious metaphysical mechanism, being transferred into the words it pressed into the page. And you might not think that these side effects are that bad, sure. But again, how do we decide where to draw the line? Well, Nietzsche had decided that these effects were too much for him. He decided that he wasn't willing to give up power over his own writing. He wasn't willing to let a machine change him or his writing. It was effective, but it wasn't good. That's where he drew the line. So let us ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up for the sake of our students, our children? What is too much for us? For Nietzsche, it was a few words, some sentence structure here and there. For us, where do we draw the line? How much do our students have to go through? How many hoops do they have to jump for us to say enough? When will we decide that just because something is effective, that doesn't mean it's good? Our students are going through systems that are fundamentally dehumanizing. Education theorist Hurt Vista argues that school really serves three purposes. It helps convey content knowledge, it socializes, and it subjectifies. And our schools are currently really focused on just that content knowledge stuff. Schools, right now, are seen simply as places that students go to get information and then get tested to make sure that they've retained that information. But when schools just focus on this, what Bista calls qualification, they neglect socialization and subjectification, leaving students feeling isolated and without purpose. Qualification on its own is effective, but it's not good. Right now, we're seeing a worrying increase in anxiety, depression, and feelings of helplessness among teens, adolescents, and young adults. And yeah, schools probably aren't totally to blame for this, but they sure aren't helping. Our continued focus on grades and test scores mean that school is often a constant source of stress. And while many of these sources of stress are effective, they aren't good. Traditional rigid direct instruction is effective at increasing test scores, but it isn't good at helping students increase problem-solving or abstract thinking skills. Strict attendance and behavior policies are effective at making students come to class and behave, but they aren't good for students' agency or long-term mental health. While virtual classes are absolutely necessary during a pandemic, especially for students and teachers who are immunocompromised, the way that many teachers and administrators facilitate virtual school is often isolating and even harmful. Like I alluded to earlier, several schools have used invasive surveillance tools like Proctorio to mine students' data and make sure that they weren't looking away from their screens during tests. Proctorio is effective at ensuring students do what they're told, but is it good? Does this headline indicate anything good to you? This is the absolute saddest headline I have ever read in my life. Like, imagine that you're taking a test and it's not going well, and you start to cry, and then your test tells you that you're cheating because you were looking away from your screen to fucking cry. I would absolutely dissolve into the floor. <laughs> when we have these virtual tools, tools that promise to give students hyper-personalized tutoring, how do you think these programs personalize what they do? 
Well, how does Twitter or Facebook or Google or YouTube know how to personalize what you see? They have your data. Like, look at this school in Silicon Valley. It promises to give kids the most personalized education. And how do they do it? They have cameras in all the walls and across the ceiling. They have microphones everywhere. Everything that students do is on tablets and computers that track every tap and keystroke. Anything they draw or write is scanned into a digital database for teachers and parents to peruse and analyze. This is all made possible by something the kids never see. An army of programmers and engineers in another room who are tracking the students' progress and helping the teachers with technology. These cameras record their teaching sessions so they can review it later. Everything is data. Data mining is effective. But is it good? Uh, while I was doing research for this video, I ended up reading a book from everyone's favorite, James Lindsay, where he was complaining about CRT, big surprise, and social emotional learning, and he argued that being in dialogue with your students was akin to data mining. He said, the actual context of learners' lives have to be extracted from learners. The method begins with a phase of dialogue or other methods of data mining the learners for the circumstances of their lives. <sighs> this guy thinks that talking to your students is data mining. Like, no, James. Data mining is not the teacher asking your kid about their lives or asking their opinion on a lesson. If you want to find data mining, look at your Silicon Valley buddies. They're the ones who are actually invading the privacy of children. <sighs> there is a long history of deprofessionalizing and dehumanizing teachers in the name of effectiveness, too. But there is just not enough space to get into it now. Trust me, I wanted to. I had like a thousand words just about these silly efficiency tests for students and teachers from the 1910s and how people in the 1950s invented machines to replace teachers, and how Silicon Valley is basically just doing the exact same thing today but acting like it's some wild new genius invention, and how these technologies are technically effective but also just bad uh, for students. But I just do not have the space to fit it in this video. If you are interested in that though, I really recommend checking out Audrey Waters' book, Teaching Machines, The History of Personalized Learning. Uh, as well as her personal blog, which I have linked in the description. They are both really great and go into a lot of detail about the history of all of this, and it is fascinating. Anyway, falling prey to this beast of efficiency has very real consequences for all of us. As Douglas Rushkoff puts it in his book Team Human, Whenever people are captivated by a new technology, it becomes their new role model, too. In the industrial age, as mechanical clocks dictated human time and factory machines outpaced human workers, we began to think of ourselves in very mechanical terms. We described ourselves as living in a clockwork universe in which the human body was one of the machines. Our language slowly became invested with mechanical metaphors. Even everyday phrases such as fueling up for eating lunch or he has a screw loose for thinking illogically conveyed the acceptance of humans as mechanical devices. As a society, we took on the machine's values of efficiency, productivity, and power as our own. We sought to operate faster, with higher outputs and greater uniformity. In the digital age, we think of our world as computational. Everything is data, and humans are processors. That logic does not compute. She multitasks, so she's capable of interfacing with more than one person in her network at a time. How about leveling up with some new life hacks? The language alone suggests a new way for human beings to function in the digital media environment. Projecting human qualities onto machines, like seeing a car grill as a face or talking to a smartphone AI like a person, is called anthropomorphism. But this is the opposite. We are projecting machine qualities onto humans. Seeing a human as a machine or computer is called mechanomorphism. It's not just treating machines as living humans, it's treating humans as machines. When we think of ourselves as computers or as machines, we start to see fundamentally human traits like intelligence and creativity as mechanical. As Nicholas Carr puts it, if our brains are computers, then intelligence can be reduced to a matter of productivity, of running more bits of data more quickly through the big chip in our skull. Human intelligence becomes indistinguishable from machine intelligence. And this is precisely what we're seeing in our schools and workplaces. 
If brains are machines and machines can be optimized, then brains, and thus the people attached to them, can be optimized too. From the issue of homework in high schools to crunch in the VFX industry to the rise of AI, we are treating humans more and more like computers and computers more and more like humans. Homework is effective. Crunch is effective. AI is effective. But are they good? <laughs> like Nietzsche's typewriter, these tools may help us do our jobs more efficiently, but we have to ask ourselves if the side effects are worth it. All that makes us human, our wasted time staring off into space as we think deeply on the wild, passionate thoughts that enter our brains on a whim, our deeply personal connections to others, our art, when we live our lives as dictated by the machine of efficiency, the machine that says, thou shalt not waste time, thou shalt be effective at all costs, when we live by those laws, we lose what makes us, us. Google's easy assumption that we'd all be better off if our brains were supplemented or even replaced by artificial intelligence is as unsettling as it is revealing. It underscores the firmness and the certainty with which Google holds to its Taylorist belief that intelligence is the output of a mechanical process, a series of discrete steps that can be isolated, measured, and optimized. In Google's world, there's little place for the pensive stillness of deep reading or the fuzzy indirection of contemplation. Ambiguity is not an opening for insight, but a bug to be fixed. The human brain is just an outdated computer that needs a faster processor and a bigger hard drive and better algorithms to steer the course of its thought. Interesting stuff! When we allow ourselves to be motivated by efficiency, when we allow ourselves to run like a machine or a computer, we lose something fundamental to what it means to be a person. I don't know that any amount of effectiveness, any goal, is worth that. This job is difficult, you know, it has its pretty difficult moments, especially with, you know, hate comments and the algorithm being this really difficult to understand system. And, you know, video editing, like getting into that as a total amateur, I mean, it is a really steep learning curve. It is not super beginner friendly, um, but... I mean, yeah, like, uh, it's, you know... It, Yeah, I'm I'm thinking. <laughs> the problem with efficiency goes deeper than just a problem with how we define waste or whether what we consider to be effective is actually good. Because all of it comes down to a bigger question, a question of how we value the parts of us that are fundamentally human. The problem with efficiency, part of the reason why it is such a powerful mainstay in our culture, is because it feels really intuitive. It feels like the right way to do things. But remember, as a cultural thing, it's really only been around for a hundred years or so. While it feels innate and obvious and vital to every part of society, it's not. <laughs> it's like the concept of credit scores. Our credit scores run our lives and allow, or prevent, us from doing all sorts of stuff like buying houses or cars or even just applying for credit cards. They are such an important part of our economic infrastructure, and yet, credit scores, the way we know them at least, have only been around since the 90s. We're letting something from the 90s control our lives. Do you know what the 90s were like? They sucked. People dressed like this. I was a baby. It was a bad time for everyone. <laughs> Efficiency is like credit scores. Well, like credit scores plus 80 years. But just like credit scores, efficiency feels like it's so deeply entrenched in our culture and our systems that even though it sucks, it feels impossible to get rid of. And its roots are so deep and its influence is so overwhelming that it's hard for us to imagine anything different. And let's not forget who the people are who are really gunning for this whole efficiency business. The people who are keeping this whole thing alive. The tech sector's overarching philosophy 
remains bent towards treating the human brain and body like a machine that can be tweaked and perfected until it is running at peak efficiency. Yet again, the definition of what's efficient and why is a product of the people in power, not science. In fact, there's no one universal strategy that makes each and every one of us as productive as possible. Just as there is no one strategy guaranteed to spark the next big idea. Until the tech industry recognises that reality, it'll remain a working environment that's best suited for one very specific type of individual. And the products it creates will continue to primarily meet the needs of that very same group. There's a reason that the people who have the most to gain from all of us adopting an efficiency mindset are the ones who are pushing the hardest to make it seem like an obvious, inarguably great thing that's just an inherent part of society. But it's not. The way things are isn't the way they have to be. We can choose to say no to efficiency. We must. We must learn to value patience and creativity and mistakes and messiness. Because that's what makes us human. We must stop treating people like machines. We must stop treating our own brains like computers. We must stop seeing intelligence and creativity and art as a mechanical, deterministic process that just requires the right inputs to get the optimal outputs. We weren't put on this earth to be efficient. You, watching this, we're not born to spend your time as efficiently as possible, being productive and hustling, hashtag, on that grind. You were born to stare out windows at the world around you. You were born to connect with other humans, to feel all the things there are to feel. To eat delicious foods and pet puppies and cry at art that makes you sad and laugh with people who bring you joy and just live. <laughs> You're here for a reason, and that reason has nothing to do with efficiency. But there's a reason I didn't title the video Efficiency is Bad, actually, or Efficiency is Garbage and Here's Why, as good as those titles may be. Because I'm not here to say that efficiency is inherently evil. Efficiency can be good. <laughs> we do have a finite amount of resources in this world, so it's a good thing to use them carefully. It's just that when we let it take over our minds and our lives, when we become obsessed with efficiency, we end up losing a lot of the good stuff that comes from inefficiency. It's not that it's a great evil, it's that efficiency isn't necessarily good, and inefficiency isn't necessarily bad. At the end of the day, efficiency is just one way of doing things. It is one priority among many. Efficiency doesn't rule us. It can be helpful and even good in many cases, but it is something worth questioning. While efficiency may, as many in the tech industry want us to believe, give us better, crisper views of reality, we should ask ourselves whether that's really what we want to see all the time. As efficiency lures us to stare at the bright, celestial future of what humankind could be, let's Wait. Stare out the window. Take a moment to just be, to just exist in this world. And listen a little while to Edgar Allan Poe. He impaired his vision by holding the object too close. He might see, perhaps, one or two points with unusual clearness, but in so doing he necessarily lost sight of the matter as a whole. Thus, there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her and not upon the mountaintops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at a star by glances, to view it in a sidelong way by turning toward it the exterior portions of the retina more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly, is to have the best appreciation of its luster, a luster which grows dim just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually fall upon the eye in the latter case, but in the former, 
there is the more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity, we perplex and enfeeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venus herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, or too direct. Uh, thanks for sticking around till the end of the video. Um, <laughs> there's a, so I, I actually recorded this outro while I was sitting in the chair um, for the little like asides in the video. And um, at the end, um, I make a prediction about, cause I, I filmed it first. And at the end I make a prediction about uh, the energy of the video. And um, given that I had to stop. I recorded this in two sections uh, and I had to stop halfway through the script because I almost passed out. Um, <laughs> I would say that prediction was spot on past Zoe. Thank you everybody for, I don't know like where to look now. I have two camera angles and it's freaking me out. Uh, thanks for sticking around till the end of the video. This was a big one. I know. Uh, I apologize for that. It really got way out of hand. Um, it actually started out being a video about textbooks, and then it became a video about ed tech, and then it became a video about efficiency in education, and then just efficiency, like, in general. And yeah, it sort of exploded, and I apologize for that, but I hope that what it turned out to be is good. Um, I'm really happy with it. I'm stoked that this video ended up being what it is. Um, but if you liked it, then be sure to like and comment and subscribe and do you know, all those YouTube things. Uh, I want to give a huge thanks to all of the patrons whose names are scrolling by somewhere around here, um, as well as an especially huge thanks to the names that are here on my list. A Tasty Snack, Adam, Ghost I 419 Hugh Sophia, Jaded Flames, Justin Lowry, Nicholas Welch, and Robert Bradford. Thank you all so very much. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this if it were not for you. So if you want to support the channel and help me keep making videos like this, then go ahead and join patreon.com slash zoe underscore b. You get early access to videos, you get patron only posts, you get a lot of other things that I don't remember, as well as having a chance to have a poem written for you by me, an actual published poet, uh, and I read it out at the end of each video. So speaking of which, we are coming upon our poem time now. Today's poem is for Raven Ophirnan. I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. And it is called Bird Songs. How many words do birds have for sky? Do they teach their children about the expanse and the cold in the same breath? Does the owl say free while the sparrow and finch whisper fear? What does the raven call the patch of stars that leads her home? If we listened to the wind, would we too hear its name? And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. We're all done. Woohoo! Let's -a go. It's a me, Zoeo. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm I've lost my mind. I haven't even recorded the episode yet. This is I'm recording this part first. <sighs> if I have chaotic energy in the in the actual video, now you know why. <laughs> and it. I don't like, I don't know how to do this when I'm not reading from a script. This is, it's terrible. It's terrible, Zoe. It, <laughs> this is why I script like everything that I can because I don't know how to do anything when I'm talking out of my own mouth. Um. <laughs>